Have you ever found yourself wondering how it is that hackers get into company networks? Well, I'm going to show you one of the simple but very common techniques. You're probably familiar with Microsoft Word, but did you know a Microsoft Word document can run code? For example, I wrote one here that will just open a message box saying you've been hacked. Now you might notice I had to click enable content to run the code. So how would we get a user to do this? Set a nice Microsoft blue background. I'm going to add the Windows security logo, and then I'm going to make a convincing message telling the user they need to click the button. Uh, I'll add a screenshot as well, just for example. Final product looks fairly convincing, so now it's time for some real malicious code. For my example, I'm using a PowerShell script that'll download and run some malware that'll give me full access to the computer. In the real world, we probably disguise this as an email containing a financial invoice so that they would download and open the document. For demonstration purposes, the system on the left is the company computer, and the system on the right is the hacker. I'm using reverse VNC software so that the company computer will connect to mine, that way we don't have to worry about the firewall. Moment of truth, let's click enable content. As you can see from the window flash that our malware has ran and it's now connected to the hacker's system. We basically have full control over the company computer, we can see whatever is on the screen and even move windows around like so. This is actually one of the most common ways hackers get into company systems, so if you see that enable content warning, don't click it. Hey everyone, David Bombal back with a very special guest. Marcus, welcome. Hello, it's great to be on here. On TikTok, I've seen you've answered a lot of questions. What are some of the like the craziest questions that you've got? And like, I see, you, you know, you do these response videos. I like the one that you did with the Airbnb. So here's how to spot hidden cameras in an Airbnb or hotel. Now, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to look for is devices that are conveniently placed where a creeper would want to look. Take this fire alarm, for instance, it's placed right above the bed. Now, one way to see if a device is a camera is to shine a bright light at it. If you hit a camera lens, it's gonna give a bluish reflection. Now, you can test this by shining a light at your phone and seeing how the camera looks when placed under a flashlight. Now, this clock is mirrored, but if we shine a bright light at it, we can see through the glass and see there's a camera there. Now this technique can also work on two-way mirrors. So the camera is USB powered and the wall charger it's plugged into is actually also a camera. If we shine the light on it, you can see that little pinhole in the middle with the blue reflection, that is the camera lens. Night vision cameras use infrared LEDs to see and if we turn off the lights and use the front facing phone camera, we can actually see these LEDs. Now the front facing camera is the only one that tends to work because the back facing one has an IR filter. Now you can sort of see the infrared LEDs on this clock already, but if we cover up the main LED, we can actually see them a lot better. Now I wouldn't rely on this method because people usually don't shower in the dark, so if they're placing cameras in the bathroom, then they're probably not gonna bother with night vision. So these camera lenses are very small, as you can see here. So they can be hidden in anything, even a hole in the wall. So you can you just explain what you did there? <laughs> Die. I'm gonna be honest here. I absolutely hate that video. It was well, like, you got like 30 million views or something. Like, I know yeah. that's why I hate it. Um, <laughs> so it was like a, it was a kooky like kind of question. Uh, how do I find hidden cameras in my Airbnb? And I was like, yeah, there are news articles about this. It does happen. It's very very rare. It's kind of like how do I stop sharks from attacking me in the ocean? It's like. You can stop sharks from attacking you in the ocean. It's not a real risk that's very common, but hey, I'll show you how to stop the shark attacks. And it was kind of a video like that. And I didn't expect it to blow up. And then of course, like it gets 35 million views. People are like going crazy, tearing apart their Airbnbs. And I'm just like, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this stupid video I made just because someone asked has become like this like worldwide phenomenon. Like it was in, it was like in like major news sites. I was getting interview requests from like the New York times and all of that. And I was just- Because of that video. Yeah. Well, not, not to interview me. Like I, they were specifically wanting to interview about the video. There was pretty much every major news outlet I can think of wanted me to say something about that video. And I just like, I wish I could unmake it. <laughs> It's a, I, I'm just laughing. Sorry, I have to laugh about this. this. This is like the second time I think I've heard you say that um, you didn't like the, lim the limelight or the spotlight of the news organization on you, yeah? Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm just not good with publicity. Like I'm getting more comfortable with it now, but when it's like the whole, like the thing is blowing up, you have all of the media just like sliding into your DMs. Um, everyone wants to hear about it. It's like, it's, it's very overwhelming. I think it's quite funny and ironic in a way. You saved the world from WannaCry, <laughs> and your next big stunt was to use a phone to find cameras in an Airbnb. I know. It's a, and, 
I feel like both of those things were like equally as useless. Like the, the wanna cry thing had very big implications, but like at the very core, it was like one of my least technical feats. And then again with the Airbnb, like this was just like a silly video I did. And it wasn't like some some huge technical feat that took like months to work on. And I, I think this is like the theme for my life is doing like minimally technical things and then somehow becoming famous for them. It's funny because I, I heard Jack uh, of Darknet Diaries and he said he um if you if you really want to make you know your name or like people and I'm I'm saying you're probably saying it wrong, but something along the lines like if you really want to impress people, don't go to like DEF CON or somewhere and talk to a bunch of techies. You need to go and talk to people who don't know this stuff and then they'll think you like this god you know, in tech. And it sounds like that's what you've done. Yeah, it's it's definitely the case. It's like, I've like done technical feats that like, like I'm like proud, like I feel like this is my lifetime achievement, but they're so yeah. technical that only people in the industry understand what they are. Whereas like stopping a global ransomware attack, that's something that end users can understand, like the general public can understand, okay, this person stopped uh, a bad virus. And the same with the Airbnb cameras, it's like, okay, this is how you find cameras. And that is a very common thing in cybersecurity is the really technical, like amazingly impressive stuff. It usually doesn't get past like a tech audience. Marcus, I, you've, you've got a very interesting story, like I said, and um, people can see it in lots of detail on Wired and on YouTube videos. And we don't expect you to do the same here. But could, if you just could give us like the highlights of, you know, your background, because I want to I want people just to realize that you did something really special. Um, you've got an interesting story. But what's really cool, I think, is that you're taking that knowledge and experience and now you're helping others who, for instance, are trying to get into cybersecurity. So if you could just give us the quick rundown, you know, of how, how we got to where we are today. Okay, so I think the quick rundown is, um, so I started out writing malware as like a teenager. I got out of that, got into cybersecurity, ended up stopping WannaCry, which was this global ransomware virus that was launched by North Korea. Right after that happened, I kind of ended up getting thrust into the spotlight in somewhat uncomfortable way. And then yep. immediately I got uh, picked up by the FBI on the old stuff I did as a teen. And then kind of as that all blew over, I just started teaching. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I, I think you've said or I've seen it said that you like were the most famous person in the UK for two days. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I mean, I just say, I mean, I'm based in the UK. So just for everyone who's watching who don't know who the, what the NHS is, it's the National Health Service in the UK. And I mean, it was a, it was a major problem. And you, if I mean, it's better if you tell the story, but you registered a domain that basically was a kill switch for one of cries, all right? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it beaconed out this domain. It's not really... Sh- it's not clear why, but um, basically if the domain is online, it will just cease all activity. Like it doesn't encrypt the files, it doesn't spread. And uh, I typically register these kind of domains as a, uh, as a job. Like we will try and find unregistered malware domains and then hijack the malware. So I went and registered this one and it, it just stopped the entire cyber attack. It's, I mean, it's an amazing story. And I mean, I, th- I again, just for everyone watching, you can go and see Marcus's full story uh, using the links below. It's a fantastic story. But Marcus, let's let's bring it to today. You have about, if I when I looked, uh, over four hundred thousand followers on TikTok. Is that right? I think so. I haven't checked in a while. Yeah, it's probably around four hundred thousand. Tell us why are you? Why why did you start your start your TikTok channel? Um, so I'd kind of always been wanting to get onto TikTok because it just it just seemed like a really cool new platform. But yeah. I was so nervous because it's a very different generation. Like YouTube yeah. is typically like millennials and above, whereas TikTok is Gen Z. And I was like, I was just terrified that I was gonna get roasted. <laughs> and um someone forced me to go on the, to do an interview. And like people really liked my channel, so I was like, "Oh, okay, I guess I'm I'm not going to get roasted by Gen Z, so I'll I'll continue on this platform." Yeah, but yeah, how do you think I should feel? Like I'm I, I, I mock myself. I'm I'm not really a boomer, but I say I often get called a boomer. You know, where's my walking stick? So I mean, you know, guys like me get really roasted on platforms like TikTok. But I think it's amazing. I mean, I think it's amazing that someone like you with that really cool story is now teaching what I would call the next generation, but you're also on YouTube, is that right? Yeah, so I, I started out on YouTube originally. Oh God, it's got to be like 10 years ago, I think. I just, I found it quite a hassle 
people yeah. are quite picky about like the, the video quality, the editing quality, the audio quality. And it feels like you're basically making this like project production grade movie just to upload and get like maybe a thousand views. And it was just such a huge time commitment that I just like, I couldn't keep doing it consistently. I mean, that's a problem. I mean, it's, and I think you do a great job of it. Like the other one I saw you posted recently was like, should I use, someone asked you, should I use a school Wi-Fi? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was uh, like a couple of days ago, I think I posted that. I was warned not to connect my cell phone to the Wi-Fi at my school. Yeah, this is pretty much true. Um, whenever you go to a website, it does a DNS lookup and that DNS lookup is not encrypted. So they can see the domain for the website you're on. So if you go to google.com, they can see google.com. But if the website is encrypted, they can't see what page you're on on that website or what you're doing. Now, when it comes to emails, things are a little bit more complicated. It depends on if your client is encrypting messages or not. Some do, some don't. If it isn't, then any emails you send and receive while on the network, they could theoretically read. They might not have the software to actually intercept and log those, but it is possible. I think what's really cool about that is you are taking technical terms and you're bringing it down to a non-technical user's understanding, yeah? Yeah, so that's that's always been the primary purpose of even my blog when I was doing malware analysis, it was geared towards something that someone who maybe doesn't work in the industry could read and understand. Like I did have some very technical blogs which were like going through my process, but a lot yeah. of it was like, here's how this malware feature works in terms that like you could just go and find like one of your parents and just be like, hey, uh, you, it, would you want to learn about malware? And then I carried that on with TikTok and it was like, let's take this like complex cybersecurity concept and try and boil it down into a way that like people can take something away from it. When I spoke to She Networks or not She Networks, depending on you know, if you're on Twitter or uh, TikTok, I asked her the question, how on earth do you take a technical concept and boil it down into like 60 seconds? So let me ask you the same thing because, you know, I'm more on YouTube than TikTok and I find it easy to just like explain in like, 15 minutes or 10 minutes a concept, but like the two of you are explaining it in like 60 seconds. How on earth do you do that? So I was always the kid in school who would like, I would write the essays and it would be like, I would just ramble for like a thousand pages of like, yeah. like pr prelog because I just, I couldn't write long things. So I would just add words for no reason. And I was always the guy trying to pad his essay with like meaningless words to make it reach the, the, the minimum character limit. So when, when there was a platform that's, hey, you can actually, you can say things in short form, that was already my area. Like I had, my whole life, I had been someone who had, who would just like convey a concept in like a couple of minutes. And it was like, just great to finally have a platform that allowed me to do that. It's why I struggle so much with YouTube. I find it very hard to, to drag like these, these things out into like multi, like 10, 20 minute long videos. Yeah, a huge respect for both of you because I, um, I've watched quite a few of your videos and you are showing like demos really quickly. And one of the ones I really liked is like, you were showing like only in a, like, I think I didn't see, I mean, it's difficult to see how long it was, but it was like 60 minutes, sorry, 60 seconds or so. You were showing like, how do you use malware within like a Microsoft Word document? And you just had this like very basic VB script so tell us about that. I mean, I find that on YouTube, I get a lot of flack about like, this is stupid. You're not, you're showing like a basic hack and guys want to like have a lot of these hardcore hacks. But have you found that you've, you've had a lot of, I mean, okay, the forgetting the Airbnb, but have you found that you get a lot of good response on these types of like techie videos, which is like showing a bit of code and, and explaining how it works? Yeah. So I actually struggled with that video because that was back when TikTok had like a hard limit of a minute. And that yeah. one was one that should have maybe been two minutes. And I was I was just struggling to condense that one down. I feel like my TikTok audience is very different from, say, my Twitter audience. It, it, my Twitter audience is somewhat mixed now, but it used to be purely like very technical people. And if I were to just do a very, very simple video, like basic VB script macros, they would probably roast me. But then on TikTok, I have a more general public audience. So this is stuff they haven't heard of and being able to show it in its most simplistic format is the easiest to understand because like real macros, we could spend three hours going through every feature of that, but there's just simple snappy, like here is the most raw, purest form of it. And 
uh, and you can see it working is a lot easier when it comes to teaching to like a wider audience. Do you think it's worth learning like Phoebe script? I mean, the, one of the first languages I learned was Visual Basic. And when I looked at that, I thought, well, that's great to see, you know, VB still around. Probably no. Um, <laughs> I learned VB6 back when that was yeah. a thing, like probably yeah. early 2000s. And I do not remember a single thing about it. Like for that video, I had to go and relearn VB or at least learn little bits of VB because it was just so useless, I'd forgotten it. I love what you're doing as well. I mean, you use the Mr. Robot um was that a DigiSpark that you were demoing? Yeah. You were doing Mr. Robot video? Sorry, go on. Yeah, the, the, the is a DigiSpark. Um, I just had this idea one day. It's like, there are some shows where hacking is real. Like, Mr. Robot tries very hard to do real hacks. Yeah. And I, I actually have a lot of the things that they use in the show. So I was like, why don't I actually like show people how these hacks work, like how to do them yourself? And then TikTok, of course, banned my video for criminal activity. And I oh. had to... I had to beg someone on the like quite high up on the trust and safety team to basically put it back. So I decided to make a tiny hacking device out of this little thumb sized USB chip that I got for a couple of dollars on Amazon. Now this was actually featured in one of the Mr. Robot promos. I'm not done. Now this is actually a tiny Arduino device. So what I'm gonna do is program it to be a keyboard. And when the user logs on, it's gonna input a predefined set of keys, which are gonna run a malicious PowerShell command that'll give me access to the system. Now, typically with something like this, we would hide it in the back of the computer where the user wouldn't see it, but I'm just gonna put it in the top for demonstration purposes. As you can see, it has a little flashing LED, which I've just programmed so that you know it's working. So the laptop in the foreground is my hacking computer and the monitor in the background is the victim system. So right after the user logs on, the command window is gonna flash quickly as the payload is executed and then it's gonna connect back to my hacking machine. Now that we're connected, any commands I type into my machine are gonna run on the victim system. So I'm gonna open Notepad, Calculator, and then just for example purposes, I'm gonna browse the files. I mean, it's, it's Serena was saying the same thing it, and this is what I'm, concern about on TikTok. I've had the same thing. Um, the one of the, so for me, like a personal story would be, I, I have a credit card cloning video on YouTube that's got a million views or whatever. Um, and it's like old technology just showing, you know, like just to try and educate, you know, be careful with your cards. I mean, I, someone took that exact video and put it on TikTok, obviously in short form format. And they got like, I don't know, a crazy number of views. And then I took the same video and put it on TikTok and they pulled it down. So, you know, how are you navigating teaching cyber hacking stuff on TikTok? Because I'm like, as like a content creator, like I'm nervous to put stuff on TikTok because they seem to just pull it down. I learned the line because um, I, I grew up making like YouTube videos back when YouTube was a little more hostile towards hacking content. There's a line where if you show the, the I guess, criminal aspect of the hacking, but then you go into talking about like how to how to stop it, how to defeat it, how to detect it. They will usually give it a pass. But then okay. I tried that strategy on TikTok, and they will watch like the first five seconds and be like, "This is crime, yeah. ban." Um, so in the end, I actually just I gave up doing those kind of videos. Um, I've been meaning to try again because there is rumors that the uh, the community guidelines are different if you're verified, and I just got verified last week. So I'm going to like test the water and see if they will let those videos have a pass now. But it was the case where I just, I just stopped doing them because I think I was one more video takedown away from a permanent ban. Yeah. You should come to YouTube. Um, yeah, I, I think, think there's, there's, go on, sorry. Uh, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, YouTube is better now, but I did have a video taken down uh, like a week ago and it, it was like a very questionable video for them to take down. It wow. was me entering my, like credit card details into like one of those phishing sites to show yeah. what they did with the credit card. And it's like, it's not like I'm showing you how to steal credit cards or I'm, I'm stealing other people's credit cards. It's like, I'm literally just entering my own details into a phishing page. And apparently that is crime now. Scan so you don't have to. So I got this email from Stevie G, which said she saw a video of what looks like a very suspicious page. She got a similar link and wanted me to investigate. So when I click the link, it takes me to this USPS tracking page. Now the first red flag is that the domain contains the word USPS nowhere. A good scam page might actually try to look like the USPS URL or at least have the word in there somewhere, but I don't think these guys have really tried at all. Anyway, let's send to my credit card details. The previous page asked for my shipping address, but really what it was probably trying to get is my credit card billing address, which would usually be the same. Now this page is asking for a $2.13 fee to process a redelivery, which sounds reasonable. 
Now, typically a real site would immediately charge my card, but I got no charge here, which means they probably just saved my card details for later, which is a huge red flag. It claims to sent me an SMS message, but I got no such thing. What I did get is a charge for $16 about 10 hours later, and I'm guessing the 750% markup is not state tax. So yeah, it only took about 10 hours for the scammers to use my stolen card. Yeah, I find that like it's on YouTube, don't show credit card stuff or like phishing, even though I've just had a, I've just done a phishing video with Corey and um, that's done doing really well. Um, but we're explaining how it works and how to be careful with it. But yeah, it's interesting. It's it's a hard line. And I mean, this is a problem, I think, for all like content creators who do cyber or hacking stuff. It's, it's a very difficult line because you want to educate the audience. Um, but it doesn't look like the platforms are there yet. Yeah, it's very hard because the um, like the general public doesn't understand ethical hacking. Like yeah. the idea of someone knowing and using criminal techniques, but in a good way, is foreign to them. Like um, I, I most saw this with my um, my my hotel keycard cloning video. I got like yeah. so many hate comments from like you're showing people how to to like do whatever illegal stuff. And like the reality of the video was I boiled it down in a way to show the concept without actually showing how to do it. Like I make it yeah. look very easy, but that's because I'm cutting out what you actually yeah. have to do to get there. Like when, when you clone these cards, you have to basically program the cloner to clone them. And I just left out the programming part. So it looks, uh, if you just watch the video, not knowing how that works, it looks like I just have a magic device that just clones key cards. And then it looks like I'm advertising said magic device. But the reality yeah. is that is like, there's a lot of work that goes into that and people don't understand that. So they were like basically accusing me of like teaching criminals how to like break into people's houses. It's why you probably shouldn't leave access cards lying around. This is a device I picked up for a few hundred dollars. It's called a Proxmark and it can clone anything from HID cards to hotel keys. Here's how quickly it reads the data off my key card. And it still works from a few inches away. The best part is it'll even work through a coat pocket. Now obviously this whole setup with the laptop is a bit conspicuous, so you can actually put it in mobile mode and it'll work from a battery pack. Holding down the button will start a scan and when it comes into contact with a key it will save the data. Now all we need is a hoodie. Connect up the USB power pack to my Proxmark and put one in each back pocket. I'll connect the antenna to a really long USB cable, put it down my sleeve and then plug it into the back of my Proxmark. Now I can log a keycard just by brushing past it. Once I've got the data off the card, I can create an identical key, but it's actually a lot more fun to use the Proxmark itself as a key. Yeah, I mean, I have the same on YouTube. I mean, I have, you get the guys or the, you know, the people who love it, and then you get the people who hate you and say you're teaching criminals. Um, but I'm really happy to see in the last few years that ethical hacking has become more mainstream. And I think Mr. Robots helped preps with that to get people more interested. But I mean, with all the hacks out there, you know, how are companies going to protect themselves if you don't know what's going on? Yeah, like there's there's more criminal, uh, sorry, there's more non-criminals in the world than criminals. So if I teach everyone how to do a crime, then you have maybe like 5% of people who are going to commit crimes. And then you have the rest of the people who now know how to stop that crime. So it's a, it's always going to be a net benefit but people don't really understand that. So you finding that, I mean, based on the questions I see that you're getting asked on, on TikTok, um, are you finding that it's just a general audience who are interested in getting to cyber? Or is it just like general education, like what you'd see on television, perhaps? It's a, it's a mix. I get a lot of comments are like, hey, I'm looking at transition into cybersecurity. Like, how can I, how can I do that? Um, but a lot of the people are like, they don't have any interest in getting into cybersecurity. They just think the stuff is cool and they, they yeah. like to learn things. And I'm, I'm very much the same way. Like, oh man, I, I think I spent like an hour watching some dude like explain how to unclog drains. Like his, his job was <laughs> unclogging like street drains. And I was like, this is fascinating. And I, I have no intention of going to unclog street drains, but it was just, I just found it interesting. So I would, I would just follow him. Yeah, but I've, I've seen videos, you know, guys like cleaning, um, what do they, they, they mow the lawns and they clean the pavements and stuff. It's like, that's definitely a job that I don't want to do. Or they're washing cars. It's amazing how many views those kind of videos get on, on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, like there's the, you know, the pool cleaner guy who's like, has m like millions of followers and he just cleans pools. And it's like, it's interesting to watch. One of the things I, I wanted to say, I was surprised you've got like an Instagram hacking type video that didn't get pulled down. Yeah, that one was, I thought that was going to go, but I think it was because it was geared purely towards like, awareness like i didn't really yeah. show how to do it 
Here's a common way hackers get into your Instagram account that you might want to watch out for. The hacker will get access to one of your friends' accounts and then contact you basically saying that you've been nominated to help them get back into their account. On Instagram, the way the password reset feature works is instead of sending you to a password reset page, it just sends you a link that will log you straight into your account and then you can change your password from there. So what they actually do is they go to the forgot password page, then they enter your account rather than theirs, which results in Instagram sending you a login link. And then they will try and trick you into sending uh, that link to them, which is what you see here. And if you do send that link to them, it will log them straight into your account and then they could change the password and lock you out. Like and follow for more safety tips. I explained how it works, but that seems to be the line for TikTok. It's whether you explain how it works or explain how to do it. YouTube, the line is you can explain how to do it as long as you explain how to undo it. But TikTok, it seems like really... If you can say how it works, but if you show how it works, you're, you're done. From what we've said offline, you are going to be uploading content to YouTube. So for people who want to subscribe, please use the links below, show your support. Or if you if you prefer TikTok, uh, go to that platform. So on YouTube, are you going to be doing long form or is it like TikTok type style shorts? Yeah, so um, people on YouTube seem to hate my TikTok shorts. So uh, <laughs> I, I, it was always supposed to be my long form content. Like I will, I'll do some short snappy videos for TikTok and then I do the longer videos on YouTube when I when I have them. Again, for everyone who's watching, please go and subscribe, show your support, um, show your love from the community. It's amazing like from, from my point of view to have people like you that are willing to share with the next generation. So let's talk about like cyber and um, you know your sort of experience and advice because I know you've been putting some of this on TikTok and YouTube, but I'd like to like just try and wrap that information into a video for for people who are interested. It's it's it, this this has been recording sort of midway through the year, and um, I've I've done some career stuff early in the year, but it'd be nice to get an update and and sort of get your perspective. So let's ask you this question: Do you have degrees, certifications, whatnot in cyber? Uh, me personally, no. Yes, but you were have been very successful in what you've done. So I think the question is, you know. Are certifications and degrees required? Uh, absolutely not. I feel like there's no true path into cybersecurity. Degrees and such are actually a very new thing uh, to my understanding. Like there wasn't cybersecurity degrees, at least in, in the UK when I grew up until about, I'd say maybe even like 2015. Like it, they came, the, it came about quite late. So before that, you would just go and get like a computer science degree, which would be entirely useless for cybersecurity. And that would be, if they required a degree, that would meet the threshold. But a lot of companies realize that computer science is, is not cybersecurity. Yeah. So they would, if you could show some kind of experience, they would just, they would waive those requirements. So would you recommend certs for someone trying to get into the, into, into cyber? Um, or would you recommend they do something else? I, I've seen some of your TikToks, but you know, you, you've kind of recommended different things. Would, is certs good or would you just say like get experience or, you know, what, what would you recommend if I'm 18 or someone trying to get into this field? So I try to avoid recommending cause like I try to give a balanced view. Um, yeah. Because everyone is different. Like I, yeah. I really struggled at school. I'm not good at structured learning, probably because I have like weapons grade ADHD. So I can't just sit in a class all day. But um, so I found it very easy to just learn on my own, just go on YouTube and Google and blogs and uh, just research. But then there's people who who do like structured learning. So it really depends on like what do you feel at, like fits you most. Like if you feel like you're more of a like a, a university slash college kind of person, then maybe get some certs. Degrees are a little. I probably wouldn't go the degree route because it's a lot of time commitment for not really a huge benefit. Certs t seem to be uh, like more of a thing that companies look for. They would they typically prefer those over degrees because it has um, like domain specific experience, whereas like a cybersecurity yeah. degree would be very general. So I, I would lean towards certs if you like structured learning. And if not, you can, you can do it without certs. I think it's very dependent on the country in the UK and US. It's very easy to get a job without certs, but in other countries, it might be different. So I can't really say for those. But if, let's focus on the US mainly, because I think you're, you're based in the US now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things I've heard you say, and I'm a real you know, believer in this, is put your work out there. You've got a very famous blog, and how has that 
Can you tell us about that blog and tell us, you know, how it helped open doors for you? Yeah. So my blog is pretty much what made my career. I would, I just wanted to document my work. Like I was doing malware research. So I would work through my malware research and I would just document as I go. And then I'd publish that to my blog. And of course, what I was unknowingly doing was building a career profile. I was basically showing not only can I reverse engineer malware, but here's like an entire walkthrough of me doing just yeah. that which actually turned out to be more valuable than any degree certs or or whatnot because i was showing like real world experience in the uh in the domain that they wanted to hire me for yeah i mean i love that i mean it's like when i look at hiring people um i mean it depends on the job but I'll, like in i'll just take an example of video editing or something it's like i don't care what search you got show me your work show me what you can do and i think your blog is a great example of that um I believe there's a story where you, your blog opened up doors to say the UK's version of the NSA or something. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> GCHQ. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. It was, it was kind of funny because, um, I, I had just applied for GCHQ and at the time my blog was, it was malware tech blog. And then there was me, Marcus Hutchins and Marcus Hutchins went and applied for GCHQ. And then while I was in the application process for GCHQ, someone reached out to malware tech and was like, Hey, we would like to hire you. And I was at the, I had just basically been formally offered the job at GCHQ under my real identity. So I was like, uh, this is me, <laughs> like you're already hiring me. That's such a cool story. Um, and I think it just shows again, you know, put your work out there um, and people will find you. What do you think? I mean, I, I think it's obvious, but what do you think about like people posting stuff on Twitter, posting stuff on like LinkedIn, you know, getting involved on social media? Yeah, I think that is by far one of the most useful things you can do for your career. Because when you're when you're just tweeting, like you don't have to be serious. You can have fun on social media, but you will you will come across people who work in the industry and those people know people. I think my first real job offer came as a result of someone I knew on Twitter. I just got a DM one day and he's like, Hey, I work for blah, 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 big company. Uh, would you like to come work for us? And I just feel like the more time like I, this sounds counterproductive, but the more time I spent on social media, the better job offers I started getting. I mean, there's a big there's a big community in cyber on on Twitter, so it makes a lot of sense. So, if I'm like brand new, is there any like tips you'd give me? Like, obviously, start a Twitter account, go on LinkedIn. Is it like um, just like post stuff, like stuff that I'm doing, tag people like you, or you know, any kind of recommendations? Um, I typically say avoid tagging people because it feels like um, it yeah. feels like you're kind of like throwing it in their face. Whereas, like the people who are interested will find your stuff. Um, definitely document what you're doing. Blogs, I find, are the best form. Videos are cool too, but blogs really because they show up when people are searching for other things. Like there's been countless times where I've been doing research on malware. And I've come across my own blog and I've been like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and like yeah. that that will happen. And um, and then obviously like tweet those links on Twitter. Um, I'm not really familiar with LinkedIn, but I assume that would be a better place given that that's all the business professionals. I, I, I really don't know. But just get as much exposure on social media as you can. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I had someone, uh, I was interviewing someone the other day, and uh, one of the comments on YouTube was like, David, you're a real boomer asking a millennial about LinkedIn. So do you you just <laughs> you just use Twitter? You don't use LinkedIn, really? Yeah, I, I find LinkedIn to be somewhat obnoxious. It's like, I can see the purpose it was meant for, but it, it really feels like um, it's more like a social media platform for executives. And it's just like, it's not the kind of content I want to read. Like, I, I just, I don't want to read about some executive, like patting himself on the back. Let's put this in perspective. How old were you when you started writing code? 11 or 12, I think. Um it depends whether you class HTML as a as a coding language. I personally <laughs> don't, so I just say eleven. But I mean, so in other words, you were writing HTML before you were eleven, yeah? Yeah, I think about like eight or nine years old. I think you know some people who are older might see that as like I'm not as clever as you are, and I think that's also the wrong way to look at it. But the way I'd look at it is I've got daughters who are in their teens. Um, it's it's never too early to start working with IT if you if you if you love it. You know, look at you, you started young. Um, when were you starting to do malware? Like, or when did you understand malware that you could reverse engineer it or create? How old were you? Uh, so I started creating malware around like 12 or 13. And then 
Uh, I didn't really start fully understanding it enough to reverse it until I was about 15 or 16. I definitely find that like, I still am learning new things every day, but I definitely find that when you're young, your brain just absorbs knowledge so much better. Like they say kids yeah. uh, find it the easiest to learn languages. And I assume that probably applies to programming languages. It's going to be like harder to learn the older you get. So it's, it's definitely a bad idea to assume that like you're too young, like you don't have the, the knowledge and intelligence because actually it might be better. Okay. I want to get into cyber. I should blog. I should create content, put it out there. I should like go on Twitter, follow people, interact with the community. Be, I mean, be a nice person is what I always say. Be someone positive and bring stuff to the community. Don't spam people. Uh, but the big question I always get is, okay, how do I get experience? without a job. And, you know, company, it's that old, old joke, you know, you need to have 20 years of experience to get through the door. Uh, and the product has existed for five years or whatever stupid, uh, you know, example out there. How would you tackle that? Or what would you advise someone to do? So ultimately, you can certs uh, building experience, like degrees, uh, degrees are less so actually, but certs build a little bit of practical experience doing the thing yourself uh, to document on your blog is experience. Like what I found is they want experience by any means. They want to see that you can do the job. And if you have a blog post up where you're doing the job, then that will count towards experience. So I would yeah. just say, find some projects you like. Um, for me, when I started out software dev, I would just pick some random idea that came into my head and I would go and code that. And then I do the same with malware. I would just find a random piece of malware and I would just reverse it. And just finding cool projects to do and then documenting them on your blog is very, very useful. They don't even have to be like typically projects you would do for work. Like here's some yeah. silly app I wrote for fun. It's still yeah. showing that you can program. It's still showing that you can, you can document your work. Is programming required in cyber or would you recommend programming? And, you know, if there's, is there a specific language you'd recommend? What are your thoughts about coding? Um, so it's absolutely not required, but I would say it will not only boost your skills, because when you understand the coding, you can understand more about like how to protect a product or how to defeat it. I found it increased my salary a lot because not only could I do cybersecurity stuff, I could write solutions. I could be like, okay, here's the problem we're having. Like I've, I know I've reversed some malware and here's something we could build around what I've done. Um, so I would definitely say that it, that like coding is an invaluable skill, but it's not necessary. It is, uh, it takes a long time to become proficient in coding. If I had to say a language, I'd probably say start with Python because that's one of those languages where you can just throw something together yeah. and it's, it's fairly easy. It's fairly forgiving and it's very commonly used in cybersecurity. What's your thoughts about like Golang versus Python in the future? Would you, I mean, I, I see that I've heard that Apple are removing Python from from um, Max as an example. Um, do you think Golang is another language people should look at? So I'm on the fence about Golang because it hasn't really gotten widespread adoption. It's still quite niche. Um, yeah. It's a very good language. It's very easy to program, again, very forgiving. It's basically someone has combined the best aspects of Python, C Sharp, C, maybe even a bit of PHP. But it doesn't, I don't see it that much. Like if I were to go to a random company and be like, hey, can we write this in Golang? They'd probably tell me no. My, my company specifically does use Golang, but I don't see it around very much. I think, you think there's a future in it or is it like still like, if, if, you are, if you're on the fence, just learn Python, yeah? Yeah, I would definitely say Python right now. And the beautiful thing is once you learn Python, Golang is a breeze. Like I, I think it took me a couple of weeks to to be able to write Golang from just like knowing Python and why well, I did know C, but once you get some languages down, learning new languages becomes very, very easy. How would you go about learning languages? And, you know, is, do you have books, stuff like that? Or is it just like YouTube videos? How would you suggest someone, or, you know, look at, look at TikTok, but, or, you know, what, what, what would you recommend? Again, I'd probably say it's, it's personal preference. Go and watch yeah. some YouTube videos. And if you find that sticks for you, great. Maybe, if not, get a, I actually, I wouldn't say get books. Like most of this stuff you can find in like in virtual format. So I'd say maybe go and find a PDF version of a book. And if that works for you, great. But what really, really worked for me was just coming up with an app idea. I, yeah. I think I, my first app was some kind of uh, like trading bot or something. I just like, 
I want to make a trading bot. And then I just threw that together. I, I'm, I'm very much in agreement with that. I um, I remember taking a university course on Python from the um, a famous UK university, which I won't mention right now. But um, I, I thought it was the most boring course on earth because they were just teaching Python, like from a math or maths for the UK viewers point of view. Um, it, it, there wasn't a real reason. And I wanted to learn Python at that time for like network automation. Um, yeah. I, I, go on, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I struggled a lot with math in, uh, or maths in, in college because I, I really did enjoy math. I was very good at it, but the yeah. way they would teach it was a very just theoretical. It's like, they're not telling me how is this useful? How can I use this? What can I do with this? They're just like, yeah. blah, 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 plus blah, blah, blah blah, blah, blah. Yep. And it was just so unbelievably boring. I just, I couldn't follow. Yeah. I mean, I think I've heard you say that you found the computer courses, same thing, computer courses, so boring that you just went and studied books. Sorry. Or you, you, well, you tell us, what did you do? Because the courses were boring. You did like a whole bunch of stuff on the side. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I think I was studying malware development at the time. <laughs> so I was, I was writing malware while they were trying to teach. What were they trying to teach? I think it was HTML5 or something. Like the course was supposed to be, I think, C, but a lot of the class was struggling with like the basic foundations of programming. So they yeah. dropped it back to HTML5, which is a lot simpler. And like the course was supposed to be an object oriented programming. So doing HTML as object oriented programming was just ridiculous. <laughs> and I, it was so unbelievably boring. I just couldn't. Was that at uni or was that uh, at school? So it was a community college. I, I don't know what the American equivalent of that is. Maybe it's the same thing, but it was it was that bit between like high school and, and university. Again, I was going to say, I really agree with like, don't learn programming for the sake of learning programming. Learn programming to accomplish a goal. Like you you were doing like malware analysis. Is that why your your blog is called Malware Tech? Is that is that like sort of where it came from or why is it called that? Um it was it was kind of a joke about the fact that um like I when I when I very first started the blog, it was um it was when I was still a malware developer. So it was yeah. kind of a, an inside joke about me being like me writing malware. So let's talk about that. How do I, if I want to get into malware or reverse engineering, do you have any recommendations for that? Because that's what you do now, is that right? No, but I, I think it's the closest thing that is explainable to what I do. Yeah, so malware is a very hard one to get into because it's not it's not a foundational skill. It's um, It's basically the opposite of software engineering. So first you have to understand how the software is built then you have to understand how to, to take it apart. Then on top of that, you have to understand the tools and all of the like mitigations malware can have. So it's really three levels of skills. My background was programming. So I came from a programming background. I didn't have to learn that specifically. I would probably suggest that it would be best to learn programming if you're going to do malware analysis. I haven't heard of anyone getting in from a non-programming background. I'm sure there are people but I can imagine it would be very, very hard to learn how to reverse engineer code at the same time that you're you're learning how code works. Yeah, so I mean, like do computer science or like at least like learn Python or at least get into the coding world, is that right? Yeah, so if, uh, if you're doing native software reversing, you'd probably want to learn x86 assembly or uh, x64. The other question I wanted to ask you, which I missed earlier, is do you recommend bug bounty as a way to get experience? Honestly, I, I, I hate bug bounty. Um, <laughs> it's. It, what do you mean? You're going to become a millionaire doing bug bounty? Come on! <laughs> <laughs> like it genuinely feels like um, what's it called? You know those those schemes where people like sell hair products and then you have to get yeah. people on you to sell the products. It feels yeah, like, like a downline that like multi level marketing or whatever. Yeah, it feels like that because you have you have some very skilled people at the very top making millions, and everyone else is just making dimes. Like if you're from a poor, like a poor country, then I would very much recommend it because that money in a, in like an impoverished country is a lot. But if you're living in the U S like $500 for a month of work is like, you could, you could just go and get a job and get paid like 10 times that. But I think when you, when you, you covered this on TikTok as well, you said, do it um, when you're in school, I think was what you said. Like, do it to get experience. Is that right? Yeah. So my recommendation was if you're going to do bug bounty, 
do it as either a side job or while you're in school learning because the money is not consistent the companies will they will screw you and it's it's very like anxiety inducing to try and rely on something that essentially there is no guarantee you're going to get paid there's no monthly income there's no uh, 401k there's no medical leave you're basically just you have to find a bug to get paid so i i think it's quite a predatory industry you're basically essentially asking people to work like i don't know if the us has the word but in the uk we call it zero hour contracts and it's just it seems very much like exploiting labor but again if you're if you come from a lower income country that money is is very decent and yeah i would do it yeah i like what you're saying do it when you've got another job or you in school and you want to get experience yeah so don't that's not your don't don't go quit your job to do that do that on the side i think is what you say yeah, yeah. i see people on on uh, twitter like there's a couple of bug bounty millionaires who are basically just suggesting people quit their job to to do bug bounty and oh it scares me yeah i mean it's um, i think it's important that we um we look at the good the bad and the ugly of everything and i wanted to ask you about ctfs what do what's your opinion of ctfs because that also gets a lot of like uh, people say do ctfs i think it's a it's a good way to tune certain skills i i find a lot of them don't correspond to like real world hacks or real world skills but it will be like a ctf that covers reverse engineering it doesn't matter what you're reverse engineering you're still reverse engineering but i do find that a lot of them don't really show the real world things like um hack the box a lot of the hacks on hack the box are not things you would typically encounter in like a real network but you are still learning like python and you're learning about exploits and you're learning how like linux works so you yeah. are getting valuable skills but it's best not to assume that you are learning everything i i think it's important like you said it's um i mean the goal there is to get a flag in the real world you're not going to necessarily get a flag are you but it's i like what you said earlier different people learn differently and in your your path isn't the path necessarily for everyone yeah um i like what you said you know find what works for yourself if it's youtube videos use that if it's tiktok use that i find it like strange how some people like say because this is their view they try and force everyone down that path and you know people are different i mean you from the uk and you live in the us I'm from South Africa. I live in the UK. Everyone's different. You got to find what works for yourself, right? Yeah, like I I really don't like the people who will they will say, "Oh, you need to have certifications because I had certifications or you need to have a degree because yeah. I have a degree." And they just try and like funnel everything into this very narrow world view they have, whereas like I I've, I've spoken to people who have gotten into cybersecurity through like they worked in a medical field and because they understood medical devices, they could understand how to secure them. and yeah. it's like there is no set path in fact i would say cybersecurity or tech in general is one of the like least structured fields there are a million ways in and i i don't like when people try and make it sound like you have to do this or you have to do that in order to get into the field because it's it's simply not true yeah i mean i think you one in one of your i think it was either youtube video or yeah i think it was one of your youtube videos you showed that chart where like how vast it was right Yeah yeah that was a uh, yeah it was a youtube video now this is something someone sent me it's basically a map of all the certifications which correspond to different areas of infosec so once you've figured out what area of infosec you want to get in you can look at what certifications map to that area Marcus what what what's the plans because i want to ask people to go and subscribe to youtube channel what are you sort of your plans going forward are you going to create more content on tiktok youtube where can people go and what would you recommend they do to like learn from you um so i think i the youtube videos are the most informative because they're longer form tiktok is cool to like learn like quickly uh, a concept it's very snappy it's not too much of a time commitment but i am going to be focusing like my i'm trying my hardest to come up with youtube videos but it's a lot of the stuff i do just ends up being a minute or two and it's better off on tiktok but i would definitely just uh check out my youtube i do have a lot of videos on reversing how to get into cybersecurity and probably check out my tiktok as well but marcus you need to you need to have like a decade of experience and a degree before you can actually teach or write code right <laughs> i actually 
people make jokes about it, but I do genuinely see like job postings like that. There was one, I think famously uh, that got posted on Twitter where the job was genuinely requiring more experience in a language yep. than that language had existed for. So yeah, you will find a lot of job postings with insane like requirements. And my advice is just don't get disheartened by them because it's actually a very small minority of jobs. It's just yep. the companies that people think of. Like the biggest issue I see people uh, running into is they, they think tech companies, they think uh, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, and yeah. those are very big corporations with like HR departments who are going to have all these filtering techniques and they're going to do keyword searches on your resume. And if you don't have certain keywords, they're just going to throw it in the bin without reading it. But then there's plenty of small companies who will hire you at like insanely high salaries with just the minimal needed experience. So I think it's more like, uh, it's kind of a perspective thing is it seems like you need all these qualifications to get into cybersecurity because some of the very big companies require those. But then if you look around the smaller companies, it's actually very, very liberal. I, I, that's, I think that's great advice. And I think it's a, it's a great advice for someone who wants to create content or just to learn. And it's great advice for someone who's looking at a job and, you know, there's like a hundred different requirements. Don't let that put you off, you know. I always say apply, even if you um, even if you don't meet the requirements. Sure yeah. So, so one thing I would definitely add to that is I have seen job postings where it's like you must have a degree and you must have certifications, and then a recruiter has reached out to me and been like, "Hey, we would like to hire you for that job," and I was like, "I can't. I, I don't have the qualifications there. Don't worry, we'll just waive them." And there are a lot of companies yeah. that are willing to waive the uh, the requirements. So, absolutely, what you said. Even if you don't meet the requirements, apply for the job because there is a good chance they're struggling to fill that position, and they will they will look to you as a viable candidate. Yeah, I mean, I think you've said it on TikTok as well. I mean, the, the companies are so desperate to have people. There's a lot of opportunity, isn't there? Yeah, like um, I know we've hired people who don't have any skills in their area. We're hiring them for because you can you can tell if someone has the like the drive and the ability to pick up new skills. I, I love to hire people who like, maybe they don't necessarily understand malware or they don't understand like whatever we're hiring them for, but they've shown like initiative and they can teach themselves. They can be self-sufficient. Like those are my favorite kind of employees because maybe we're doing malware analysis today. Maybe like someone, like maybe malware gets solved and we have to go and find something else. Well, now we've got to retrain that employee. But if you have someone who can just teach themselves, they're self-sufficient, then it doesn't matter what you want them to do. They will just go and learn it. Yeah, I love that. I mean, to so you interviewing people, um, what would you, like for the candidates that you've interviewed, what's like really stood out? Like it made you think, okay, this is someone I want to hire. You've mentioned like they need to be able to like teach themselves. Is there anything, like any other tips, like for someone who, who goes to an interview, how, how can they, what advice would you give me as an example? Okay, not me, but someone like who's younger perhaps who wants to be interviewed by you. What are the like tips to, you know, let you make them more likely to be hired by you? Um, so I don't really do hiring much, but, um, and I, I must caveat that my hiring practices probably are not in line with the industry norm. <laughs> but um, my, my first thing is, of course, like, is this person like self-sufficient? Are they going to be someone we're going to have to uh, give lots of training to and we're going to yeah. have to point in the right direction? Or is it someone who has like a, a knack for learning and they, they like to explore and they like to like bring in new things? Yeah, so self-efficiency is my main one. And um well, probably the last person I tried to hire, we weren't successful in hiring them. They got poached, but um, uh, he was in a he was in a chat I was in, and he was like sharing his work and collaborating with others. And I was just looking at this person like like they can teach themselves, they can go and find new things on their own. They work great with others. They're like very open to collaboration, yeah. and like that's my perfect employee. Even to the point where like if someone collaborates with other companies, I I don't mind. Like as long as they're like, they're doing the work for us and they're like, they're learning things from their collaboration with other companies. Like I, I really couldn't care less if they're also helping another company. Yeah, I mean, I love that. You've got to, you know, in school and places that are not real world, they expect you to like take a test by yourself, but in the real world, it doesn't work like that. You have to collaborate. Absolutely. Like cybersecurity is probably one of the most like collaborative fields I've seen it's like, it's so vast and like everyone has like a, a little bit of insight that someone else doesn't have. So the more people you have collaborating, the the better it is. 
I've got to the point where we've like actually given technology to rival companies in return for their tech and like the rising tide, it raises all boats. So we're not losing out by actually giving away our IP to rival companies because there is so much to be learned. I want to wrap this up with like, what was, what's your final advice for instance, someone who's young or someone who's older? Do you have any advice for, and I, 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 I mean, you can give us your age if you like, but you don't have to, but like someone who's younger and want to get, wants to get into this field, you know, what's your advice? Yeah, I think it really goes back to what I said earlier. Um, find what works for you when it comes to learning, learn some things while you're learning, show those things to other people. I find it seems counterproductive to be teaching things that you're you're learning, but I find it's like that's when the knowledge is the freshest and you actually solidify your knowledge by then trying to explain the things you've learned to other people. Um, I definitely did that a lot on my blog. I was blogging things that I had only just learned. And um, I think that's very valuable, not only from a, a career perspective, but from a just solidifying your knowledge. You know, I really want to just talk about that because I've seen like people, I hate to, I hate to use the term, but gatekeeping saying you have to have like a certain amount of knowledge before you share. And I'm really against that because I agree with what you've just said. If There's no better way to learn than to teach. Um, and even if you teach to yourself, you know, put it in the blog and five people read it or you read it later. Yeah, because you sorry go on yeah so one thing i've definitely has happened to me is like i've been struggling to understand a concept because maybe the person who first portrayed that concept didn't put it in the best words and then someone who did understand their words came along they learned it they put it out on their blog in some different words and i was like ah that it just like clicked yeah. And I think that is very, very valuable. And I, I think it's it's complete nonsense that you have to have uh, lots of experience or you have to be an expert in order to portray something you've just learned. Well, I guess I could keep you here for hours. I really want to thank you for sharing, you know, your experience. And thank you for putting yourself out there because I know as a content creator, some people throw stones, but I really appreciate you sharing, you know. Thanks so much for having me on. Great. Thanks, man. Thanks, man.